Hello and welcome. In this on-demand webinar, OJM Group partner, David Mandel, discusses five things you can do now to strengthen your personal finances during the COVID-19 crisis. David is an attorney and well-known authority on asset protection, risk management, and wealth management. He has spoken at numerous medical conferences and written dozens of articles on financial topics. David holds a bachelor's degree from Harvard University and a law degree in MBA from UCLA. David and his partners at OJM are the authors of 12 books written specifically for doctors, including our newest book, Wealth Planning for the Modern Physician, Residency to Retirement. To get your free PDF or ebook download, text OJM Cares to 555-888. Well, thank you, Emily, for the introduction. I appreciate that. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing your personal finances during this COVID-19 crisis five actions to take now. Let's jump into it. Number one, be in contact with your financial quarterback. Now, uh, this is important uh, because you don't want to go it alone. This causes stress and can also lead to bad decisions. And I think that's one of the um, takeaways we know from past crisis and financial downturns. Um, and so if you have a financial quarterback, and that's a term we use at OJM Group, uh, and if you don't, uh, we'll talk about number five later in this, uh, in this webinar, but if you do, you want to be in touch with them uh, because not only do they have expertise and experience, I mean, we've got folks who, you know, not only, of course, managed assets for our clients in 0809, but uh, we're dealing with this with clients in um, uh, through September 11th to the dot-com crash, the recessions of the 90s back to, you know, um, uh, 1987, the sharp down to then. So not only do they have ex expertise and experience, but they can also look at things as from kind of a, from a non-emotional point of view. And so having regular communication, especially if the markets continue to go down, uh, as I record this uh, in uh, April 3rd, um, you know, we did, we had a se severe downturn, then it came back when the stimulus um, was announced. And who knows where, by the time you hear this, uh, we could be uh, stable, we could be up, we could be significantly down, we don't know. Uh, but having that regular communication with your uh, financial quarterback is key. And advisors, in addition to be, you know, professionals and experts in what they do, like a physician, should have bits at good bedside manner, right? They should be good listeners. They should listen to people uh, express their fears or concerns and then try to take that and make logical, uh, reasoned uh, actions out of it. Uh, you know, my background, as any of you know me, um, uh, in, you know, being one of the principals of OJM Group and one of the founders, you know, I was an attorney for, I have been for 22 years, uh, 24 years. So, uh, and in the law, there's a saying credited to, uh, to uh, Abraham Lincoln that an attorney represents him, himself as a fool as a client. And it makes sense because when you are the client and it's your case, you get emotional. You can't see uh, the forest of the trees, all those kinds of analogies. And so uh, many people who don't have a good financial quarterback or trying to do things on their own, they can be subject to more reflexive brain thinking, as we'll talk about in a, in a minute. So, you know, the evidence is quite clear. Again, in our books, Wealth Management Made Simple, we have a number of studies that show the benefit of financial advisors to clients. This Vanguard study is one of them. There's a Morningstar, there's some others. Uh, if you don't have that book, certainly we'll tell you how at the end of this to get that for free. Um, and that's a book just on investments in the markets and it came out a year and a half ago. Um, so we know that uh, the typical investor without financial advice makes more mistakes. Um, and we'll show some of, those, some of that data and some of it uh, from a illustrative point of view in the next slide. So without professional guidance, you can succumb to the trap of fear and, um, and before this and perhaps greed when the market was going up. And we talk, there's a whole field of science called neuroeconomics, which is applying 
uh, science to how our brains work when it comes to investing. And it's really interesting. And in our newest book for physicians, while well, planning for the modern physician, we have a whole section on that, um, borrowing from some other books and studies. And uh, our reflective brain, obviously, is our rational brain. I mean, most people, physicians, business owners, you know, lawyers, we think we use our rational brain most of the time. But when it comes to money and when it comes to fear, oftentimes we don't. And that's the evidence. Um, and we want to caution clients about that. And, and, and the role of financial quarterback is to be a buffer from some of those reactions. So one of the studies we talk about in the new book uh, is an old one uh, from the 1980s, but it's very um, applicable today. So it was at MIT and they had two groups. They had a group that just had the, uh, they were given a certain amount of money, uh, both groups, and they were, you know, wanted to see how they would fare against each other in terms of investing performance. The first group just got the financial information on the company. Uh, so, you know, your 10Ks, your quarterly reports, your, your annual reports, and that was it. So they were able to look at the different companies and, and make uh, investments and changes as they needed to, um, uh, but not too many changes based on the financial information. The other group got all that same financial information on various companies, but they also had access to the financial news. Now, this is from the 1980s, the late 80s. Financial news was like uh, the Rukeyser, the Wall Street uh, Review, very calm PBS type stuff. Compare that to financial news today, where it's, you know, uh, bells and whistles and screaming and mad money and, and all of that on CNBC 24-7. So if um, it was much different then, but still what was shown at that time is the group that had the financial news, in addition to the financial reports, did worse. They traded more based on the news. They thought they could see patterns. They thought they could make uh, timing uh, bets. And uh, as compared to the other group, which just had the financial uh, information, but no news. And so they traded more and they performed worse. And you can imagine back then, compared to today, the kind of news uh, cycle we've got, uh, especially in the financial world. And I worry about uh, clients, not so much of ours, but of either people, uh, advisors who aren't on top of it, who aren't professional, or folks without advisors, that they'll make some serious mistakes that they will take years to make up on uh, after we're through this crisis because they have um, succumbed to some of that reflexive brain uh, thinking, uh, looking at the news. So one of the things a good advisor should be doing is helping you look at the long term from a macroeconomic point of view. We're going to talk about in the next step or the next uh, uh, action to take uh, the micro point of view. But this is kind of a, a slide that I think good advisors should be showing clients that shows for the last 120 years of the stock market, there have been a crises, maybe not like this one. OK, certainly this is unique, but it's not the only financial crisis uh, all, all of you probably listening to this know remember the uh, global financial crisis in 2008. In some ways, in the financial markets, that was even more scary. Uh, and we hadn't been through that before either. Uh, but now, if you look at that, it doesn't really look like a huge um, variation of the upward trend. It looks like a blip on the screen, OK? I mean, even the Great Depression, if we go back uh, to 1929, which was a severe uh, uh, downturn in 29, the stock market crashed. But the depression went from 29 to 39, right? And you can see between probably the bottom there, 1931, it climbed up significantly by the time it hit 36. Now it came back down again, um, uh, and then through World War II. But from that point on, it was like 40 years of, of almost upward, mo uh, uh, upward motion. But even in that Great Depression, we had uh, a significant upturn from the bottom in that time period before 36. So you can see that. So I think, um, uh, and I think one other thing that's interesting is the last time we had a pandemic, 1918 after World War I, uh, after we got through that pandemic, it was the roaring 20s. You can see how far up we went uh, straight up at that point. So does this, I hope this gives you some comfort, those watching this. And this is what good advisors should be giving. It's not to say we're through the worst of it. It's not to say we know how long it's going to be. It's just to say that uh, history tends to repeat itself. And um, 
this uh, long-term 120-year view can show you that uh, we may look back on this as a significant setback, but one that uh, uh, we make up fairly uh, rapidly. And even if it's not rapidly, it may be, it may be uh, uh, aggressively over time. These next two illustrations are what um, I wonder, what I worry about for folks who aren't getting good advice. You know, up until we had this crisis in the end of February or early March, we had a lot of clients on the top of the scale talking to us, you know, why do we have any bonds? Why do we have alternative strategies that are doing decently, but it's not performing like the S&P? The S&P is getting 30%. Why aren't 100% in the S&P? I want to take more risk. Why do we have a balanced portfolio that's underperforming the highest uh, uh, asset class that year, which balanced portfolios always will. They're never going to be at the top. They're never going to be at the bottom. They're going to be balanced. Okay. So we had a lot of clients like this. Again, we're, our job is to say, listen, even though the market's up and it's been going up for the last five years, almost, you know, other than the fourth quarter of 18, almost uh, unchecked, we need to have some defensive strategies. We need to have some, uh, some uh, alternatives that don't move with the market. And that helped us, and that's been helping us and our clients for the last month. Um, but that was before. So it was buy, let's get more aggressive, let's get more aggressive. And then the worry is market goes down as it has in the last month. Oh my God, I got to get out, reflexive rain, sell everything. And if you do that, if you want to get in when the going's good and you want to get out when the going's bad, you will go broke. And that's what we want to avoid. Okay. Uh, a lot of data on this, and this, this actually came out in 2008 or nine. this illustration, um, uh, and it was referring back to the dot-com um, uh, uh, bust in 01. So it looks like, just like it did 10 years ago, and now we can say it looks just like it did 12 years ago, which is that investment return, what you see in the S&P, what you see in an index fund, what you see in a mutual fund actively managed, is almost always a higher return than the investors who put the money in because they make behavioral decisions that hurt them. Okay? Not that many people uh, without good advice can uh, either stay the course or um, avoid mistakes that um, uh, go along with investing in terms of behavior. So this behavior gap, it can be seen over and over and I can send 20 slides showing the different data over any time period that shows um, that shows that to be true. So we want our clients to avoid this behavior gap and not make bad decisions. As we'll see in a couple of slides, it doesn't mean we don't do anything, okay? But we wanna make avoid making mistakes. And here's a really a crucial uh, piece, and uh, maybe if, if I could do this. Um, this is a, and this is probably our busiest slide, but I want to explain it because I think it's, it's really valuable. And again, you don't need to take a photo of this. If you want to, you can, but it's in our books. It's, it's easy and wealth management made simple, as are the illustrations. But this is really interesting. From 1999 to 2018, 20 years, I think this is the Russell 2000, a very broad index. Uh, if you were in for all 5,000 plus trading days, you would have got a 5.6% return. Now, again, that's through the dot-com crash and through um, 08, 09. But if you missed only one day per year, the best trading day per year, if you missed only one day per year over 20 years, your return was a negative 0.3%. Incredible, just one day per year. So when, if someone is thinking about going to cash or reducing their portfolio, et cetera, as things go down, it's not just getting out. The question is, when do you get back in? And you gotta time those both right. If you don't get them both right, you could get really hurt. And I'll tell you how hard it is to get that right in a second, but this doesn't even include taxes. So if, men, if any of you think about, oh my God, I wanna sell, you have to always, I mean, our firm, we're always thinking about taxes. My partner uh, and colleague, uh, Carol uh, Foos, CPA, you know, she's a key part of our investment team to be helping clients with, you know, gain harvesting, loss harvesting. So for a lot of you, because we've had the market grow so much over the last five, seven years, even if things are down significantly today in this environment, if you sell, you probably have some gains. So not only are you going to potentially lose out on the way back up, but you're gonna pay taxes in addition. So this is, you know, it can be a triple whammy if you don't get it right. And how can you get it right? 
Because look at the bottom part of this slide. The bottom part of this slide shows every single daily return in those 5,305 days. And I think what you can see is that the worst days, the days that get you fearful, reflexive brain, I wanna sell, I gotta go to cash, are almost always followed by the highest, best, um, highest performing day. You can see that in the middle. Look at 08, 09, look at how deep the bad days were, a negative five, a negative 10% day. And look at where the, the two days that are above 10%, they're almost identical, they're almost in the exact same month could be in the same week. We had that just here in the corona crisis a couple of weeks ago. We had one of the worst days ever in the history of the market. And then we had the best day in the market um, in the Dow since uh, 1933, I believe, uh, in almost uh, you know 90 years. Um, and it was two days later. So how many people would have gone to cash, sold, you know, liquidated their portfolio or a big piece of it, and then two days later said, you know what, I want back in now. And then rode that back up zero. Nobody's doing that, right? So that's the problem is it's a two-part decision. I want to get out of, mark, of the market. When am I going to get back in? And it's almost impossible to time it. doesn't mean you don't do anything. It doesn't mean you don't have these conversations. Uh, if you're really uh, worried about it, this gets back to, you know, the main point of all this is be in touch with your financial quarterback, have regular communication, and um, don't try to do this on your own. So number one was all about, um, was all about uh, working with your um, uh, financial advisor, your financial quarterback, um, to look at the macro from a global, a macro, a long-term macro uh, approach and looking at sort of those uh, macroeconomic long-term trends to get you to feel a little more comfortable, lower the cortisol, kind of calm, be calm about um, where things been and, and where how what we're doing, what's, what we're going through fits in within that context. The other thing that's really valuable, maybe even more so, uh, when at working with your financial quarterback is taking a long-term perspective, not on the macro, which we've just covered, but on the micro, meaning yourself. There will be an endpoint to this crisis. It can be very helpful to focus on the long-term. And this means long-term for you. So this means getting with your advisor to look at your personal financial model, your retirement model, and whether that key, that's the key benchmark or buying the second home or paying for kids or college or grandkids, whatever that is, you should already have with your financial quarterback some kind of best medium worst case scenario that you revisit over time. This is not a, not a financial plan that should be a fixed printed document. That, that's ancient history. It should be a uh, iterative, uh, adjustable uh, program that you can put in different assumptions, different values now, well, this is down to this, this is down to this, I don't think we're gonna have income, we can't save this much, plug all of that in, see where that takes you long-term, that should be your kind of plan. And for some of you, looking at that long-term perspective will allow you to stick with the original plan. For some of you who are older, maybe in the retirement red zone, and that's kind of a football term, red zone means sort of towards the, the goal line. Um, so if you're in retirement or you are close to retirement, you may uh, need to make some adjustments, but ideally that was already made. I use my parents as an example. They're in their late seventies. My father's a radiologist still doing some locums work, even uh, through this crisis a bit as they need him. And um, his portfolio from our firm has already been um, uh, de-risked over time. And that's why last year, while the S&P got 30, they probably got eight or 10, but that was higher than we expected to get in their portfolio mix. We were, you know, we're aiming for five or six because that will get them where they want to go. That means now, as I speak today, and the market has been down about 20% this week, um, they're down less than 10. Um, so the point is there um, that some of that good work should have been done before, okay? The portfolio should have been positioned before uh, more conservatively during the recent bull market. So that's for clients who are older. But for everybody, reviewing their long-term plan can help a renewed focus on spending. How much are we spending? Let's look at that cash flow. Maybe we need to cut our spending now, and maybe we can actually cut some spending in the future to create more rainy day funds. Again, you know, um, that's kind of an individual uh, decision working with your advisor, but three, six, 12 months of rainy day funds in cash uh, makes sense. And I think more people are 
realizing, you know, closer to the 12 month is probably better to have than the three month uh, going forward. And so this will get people to focus on that. This slide, you know, shows one screen of the software we use that's very powerful. I use it for myself, we use it for my parents, we use it for all of our clients. Uh, this kind of shows uh, the retirement plan, one page of, on the left side, you can see all the, uh, the uh, different uh, uh, pages, but this one basically puts it all together and it says, based on what assets you have and some growth rate and some assumed taxes, this is what it will look like years out at different ages. Uh, do you have a shortfall? Do you have uh, uh, ending assets? What's your income stability ratio? What if we mess with the returns on the bottom? We can change different returns every year, make it worse better in the future and you know stress tested and i think a lot of clients who are stressed because they say oh my god i'm out working my finance my my savings are down how am i going to get to where i wanted to go when they start to see this and they can build in worse uh best and medium case scenarios and build it out long term i think their stress level goes down because they can say okay if this happens and we'll where we'll be and we'll just have to spend this much and if this happens uh, we'll be better off. And uh, it's not so nebulous, um, it's actually concrete. Now again, there are assumptions, and that's why part of our you know, service to our clients is review, reviewing this you know, every six or 12 months. You know, are we ahead of schedule, are we below, did we need to adjust any assumptions, et cetera. But this is a big part of it, and what people should be doing with their financial quarterback during this time. Number three. Uh, make tactical investment adjustments or don't, okay? This downturn is an opportunity for all to do something or refrain from doing something, okay? 100% uh, depends on collaboration with your advisor. Um, some of you who even don't want to really do anything, and that's great, they may say just stick to the course, there may be some uh, uh, tactical allocations to be changed just because of rebalancing. As an example, let's just say I'm a long-term aggressive investor and I have a kind of a uh, core strategic uh, allocation of 80% in equities and 20% in bonds and alternatives. Well, just because the equity markets are down 20% and the alternatives and bonds maybe haven't moved so much, now my present allocation, okay, went from 80-20, let's say to 75-25 or 70-30 because the value of the equities went down while the others stayed the same. So the, the ratio is off. So my advisor may be wanting to, in a, in a, in a thoughtful, um, you know, sort of data-driven uh, um, uh, process, you know, one with some, um, some organization and, and, and um, I can't think of the word I'm thinking of, a, a process to it, uh, rather than just, you know, looking for a down day, et cetera, but an actual um, uh, laid out process. We'll get back into, take some you know, of those bonds and maybe sell and go into equities to get me more to 80-20. And it's a thought out, um, thought out process, okay? Others, based on your situation and your, your, your um, ideally not emotions, but still your opinions and your, your feelings about things, you know, after a good conversation or two, you may wanna reduce some risk assets. And I'm not saying that's bad. Um, but for other clients, they may want to increase them tactically. We have had clients say, listen, I want to put more cash to work. I, I see some great companies here and um, they're getting, you know, the baby thrown out with the bathwater. We think they'll come back and eventually this crisis will be, will be done and, and these guys will come out stronger. And that's certainly a possible. Uh, for some folks, because of the practice, the business, a temporary change in revenue and, and waiting for some of these loans, if we can all get them, um, uh, they'll need more cash just to fund operations. And, you know, that's a serious concern and, and, and maybe that makes sense. Again, for some, it may be bargain hunting and for others, there may be tax uh, implications. I mean, it may make some sense to sell some things and harvest some gains if there's going to be other things with losses. Again, taxes is always important, even in this crisis, to think through if you're going to be making any moves. So, so far we've had Get you know communication with your your um, your financial quarterback, especially on the macro to get you comfortable. What's going on uh, long term? Micro your particular planning individually, long term. 
Uh, short term, what can we be doing now that uh, we may need to do that we should be doing st for strategic uh, allocations and maybe some bargain hunting or tax harvesting? I think the other thing we can uh, um, we can be doing now is uh, using this opportunity when many clients, because their businesses certainly many medical practice for the first time imaginable, are you know not doing uh, surgeries, not seeing patients, maybe just doing some telehealth. People have time. A lot of our clients never have time and now they have some time. So the you looking back six months, a year, 18 months, two years from now, will really thank you, the you of today, if you made this time productive and said, okay, what can I be doing now so that when I get back to being busy and I don't have the time and all the to-do lists are there, uh, that I feel like, hey, I actually accomplished some things and I'm glad I did. Now, whether that's reviewing your property and casualty insurances, whether that's looking at your, you know, many of you uh, physicians' greatest asset is your ability to earn income and reviewing that disability insurance that maybe you haven't reviewed in a while, it's as strong as it can be. Life insurance for death benefit for the family uh, is one thing. Uh, and also buy-sell agreements with partners in a practice and business. Um, but especially, I think, one thing that a lot of people may want to revisit today are these permanent life insurance policies and why? Well, again, my area of expertise is asset protection as an attorney. They have asset protection, creditor protection, which I'll mention in a minute, uh, in many states. Uh, and in almost all states, some, some of it's protected. And in many states, like where I live in Florida, where our main office is in Ohio, where I used to live in New York, total protection for these cash values. But the reason I think that most folks are going to be interested in revisiting this conversation now is whole life policies, which are a subset of permanent policies. These are crediting this year five to 6%. It's been announced by the insurance companies. Again, these insurance companies have been around hundreds of years. They're owned, often the ones we recommend, by their, um, by their policyholders, their mutual companies. So they're not, they're not worried about the stock market and they don't really invest much in the stock market. They weren't really hurt much in 0809, maybe 5% or less of their investments are in those. So, um, they're crediting five or 6%. That sounds pretty good for most clients in 2020, right? Especially since that's tax-free. Others may have an equity index policy. I've got a whole life policy, but also a large equity index policy. This is tied to an index like the S&P 500, which mine is. There's a floor and a cap though. It's a collared strategy. So the floor is zero and I think my cap is 10%. That means last year when the S&P got 30, I only got 10, tax-free though. Uh, and this year, who knows what the S&P, let's say it ends where it is today, down 20%. I don't lose a dime. I'm at 0%. And I've had this policy since the early 2000s. So I've gone through 08, 09. And, and the climb up to that and the climb out of that. But in, in 08 and 09, I did not lose any principal. So pretty strong piece of the portfolio. Just one piece. Doesn't make up anywhere near um, a majority. Uh, uh, maybe 10%. 15% of my investable assets, but I like it because uh, years like this, uh, it's probably my best performer. So that's something to, to examine. And I'll have one more slide that kind of visualizes that. Long-term care insurance for yourself and parents, good time to take care of that, look at that. Uh, asset protection, the truth is when we come out of this and as we do, and it may be a slow slog, we know as attorneys in the field that there's more litigation uh, uh, in the years uh, uh, during recessions and following them. Could be from employees, patients, business people, et cetera. So taking the time now to look at your assets, both at the practice or business or personally, and get those protected the best they can, great idea. Again, the future you will thank you for doing that. And estate planning for yourself and parents. Let's make sure that you've got the wills and the living trusts and the other documents that, again, are key. God forbid anybody has a health issue. You want the healthcare proxies. You need the powers of attorney. You need these things that many physicians see, but they don't have themselves or they haven't been updated. So take the time to do some of those things. You'll be glad you did. Here's the collar strategy I was mentioning. This shows the S&P 500 for 30 years. It shows the S&P with dividends and without dividends. And let me lose my, lose my face here so you guys can see some of that. Um, and then it shows this collar strategy, the zero to 10%, which I have inside my life insurance policy. And you can see, uh, again, use another baseball analogy. We're winning here by hitting singles and doubles. We're never hitting home runs. You know, we're never as high as some of uh, the S&P raw numbers, 
in any year. But we also, one thing you can see about that gold um, uh, uh, line is it never goes down. It's a steady going up, right? It doesn't go down uh, because in the years that it's negative at the indexes, then obviously you hit a floor of zero. So um, it's win by not losing. It's you know singles and doubles, whatever analogy you want. Uh, but it could make sense as and be many very attractive to people after they're experiencing what's going on today. Um, so something maybe you might want to visit at this time. So number five, number five is find a financial quarterback if you don't have one already. And um, maybe some of you listening to this don't, don't, or you're not sure if the person you're using is the right one for you, or you want to get a second opinion. And the most important thing uh, when it comes to financial pre uh, professionals is transparency equals trust. Very simple. You need to understand the way your financial advisor makes money. Okay. It's easy if you go to a lawyer and they say, this is what I charge for an hourly rate or in my law firm, I try to do flat fees. You know what the lawyer's paid, you know, all the incentives, it all makes sense. You can understand it. Um, physicians, if I go to a physician, and uh, you know, they're billing the insurance company or Medicare, whatever it is, I understand that, okay? Uh, what a lot of people don't understand is the financial world, and with good reason, because it's meant to be obscure. It's meant to be difficult, no pay, it can, uh, difficult to figure out. And the first thing you wanna figure out is, is your advisor or advisor you're considering a fiduciary? Will they put their best, your best interests ahead of theirs? And there's two large standards in the financial world. And I didn't realize this till I came into the financial world. And many of you probably don't realize this. There are advisors who operate under the fiduciary standard. Okay. And they're governed by different rules, different standard for liability and ethical, ethically. And then there are advisors who are subject to the suitability standard. And this is a very interesting guy, you know, uh, illustration where the fiduciary standard, you can think of the client being the center, whereas the suitability, the, product is being the center. And we have a whole chapter on the book uh, on this, five questions to ask. We show some real examples of a client wanting to put a certain amount of money in a, uh, in a uh, uh, fund. Let's just say you wanted to put you know, $5,000, let's make it $50,000, $50,000 to allocate to a large cap fund. Well, the fiduciary might be charging 1% of that. So that's $500. You understand that. And um, then they can choose the large cap fund that makes the most sense for you. It's probably the cheapest because they're not getting paid any piece of it. There's no, there's no commission, there's no kickback. The suitability standard, they don't have to find the least expensive one for you. They are likely paid by a commission. And as long as it, that product is suitable, meaning of 20 different options to get you in that large cap, they can choose the most expensive one, the one that pays them the most. And they can do that for you. And they've met the suitability standard because they found you uh, one that was for the large cap. And the, uh, the fact that they got paid the most and then came out of your investment and your investment will do poorly, poorer, at least for uh, a number of years uh, to make up for the fee uh, as compared to the fee on the fiduciary side. And again, we have examples of this in the book, real numbers. Um, even though they choose the most expensive one, they've met the suitability standard, no, no issue, okay? You want to understand if that's the way your advisor is, uh, your relationship with you or not. And it may be things that are even less subtle. Maybe they only charge a fee, but they're recommending products that are um, in-house products with their big firm, uh, proprietary products. Well, then the firm makes something. Maybe they get a bonus. Maybe they get to go on a trip. All these things that are not clear, and you have to make sure that you understand that. Okay? Fiduciary means they have to always act in the best interest of the clients. Okay? Uh, a broker, and again, as this last point says, financial advisor could be a broker. Don't, no one calls themselves brokers anymore, okay? Because they know that it has a bad reputation. So financial advisor, financial planner, lots of different terms out there. They don't mean anything, and they don't tell you anything. You have to understand and ask the questions of the business model, okay? Um, uh, but someone who is a broker under another name, I mean, that's the legal name, not what they would call themselves on their business card. Uh, they have, they're not to act in the best interest of the underlying cu customer. They only have to find something that's suitable. And the big investment companies have fought this tooth and nail and have won. Uh, and you would think, why shouldn't every financial advisor have a fiduciary duty? Well, that's not happening. 
uh, and there's been some, uh, there were some, you know, proposals for legislation regarding one area, the financial, uh, uh, financial advice regarding retirement plans, and even that uh, couldn't go through. So this is here to stay, uh, and you got to understand what's going on. I'm going to get a bonus. This is bonus uh, uh, action number six. And those of you who are listening to this uh, and watching me, uh, you've already doing this. So I'm preaching to the choir, which is use downtime to educate yourself on financial matters. Take advantage of the opportunity to learn more. So when times are good, you are protected, better positioned and more efficient. And um, uh, you can do that already. Obviously, you're on this webinar. Uh, in terms of uh, more free resources, you can get a lot from us at OGM Group. We have a free e-newsletter that comes out normally every month. We've been putting out a lot more during this crisis. Webinars and podcasts, same. We typically are doing webinars once a month, but we're doing more lately like this one. And podcasts are typically more frequent. We always will talk to people. We don't charge for that. Certainly, you can contact me if this is of interest um, to schedule a consult. Um, uh, you can email me with questions, comments, et cetera. Um, if you have any trouble with the bookstore or something, uh, technically, just let us know. You can certainly give us a call or ring uh, into my voicemail, which I get on myself. Obviously, I'm working from home. Uh, so uh, we appreciate your time uh, and uh, thank you uh, for listening. And I hope to uh, speak to many of you in the future. OJM is a multidisciplinary wealth management firm we have worked with over 1,500 physicians throughout the country. We would welcome the opportunity to speak with you about how we might be able to bring value to your wealth planning. As I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, OJM Partners have authored several books, all of which are available to webinar viewers at no charge. You can get a free PDF or ebook download for Kindle or iPad by texting the code on your screen to 555-888. You can also visit ojmbookstore.com and enter the code at checkout. Due to COVID-19 restrictions, we are temporarily unable to fulfill orders for print copies of our books, but we'll make this option available as soon as possible. In addition to our free book, OJM Group also offers webinar viewers a complimentary consultation where we can answer your questions and see if our firm might be a good fit for your situation. Visit ojmgroup.com or call 877-656-4362 to schedule a free consultation. Enjoy the free copies of our books, and we hope to have the opportunity to speak with you. Thanks for watching.